Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and this is my ninth uh, Explorer Symposium, I think. And you would think that I would know not to hang out with Aziz late at night because <laughs> it gets a little crazy by now. But this is a great honor. I spent the, uh, I spent the last couple hours uh, sitting in Alexander Graham Bell's office downstairs, thinking about how to talk about this, this thing that is innovation. You know, Alexander Graham Bell was the second president of this society. And in a moment like this, you can think about what that felt like. A phone call, the first phone call, the first long distance phone call. All of a sudden, time and space is radically changed. You know, what, what did he say? Does anybody know? Uh, Watson, come here. Watson, come here. I want to see you. I guess he wasn't happy with this. He wanted Skype, and he was trying to figure out the, you know, what he'd do next. But yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty profound. And you know, that legacy of innovation is really something that we see in every single aspect of work that has been presented over the last couple of days. Uh, you know, the idea that imagination is, is really the core of innovation is what I've known. I, I found this old, um, this old graduation speech of his through a Nat Geo article from 1917 called Prizes for Innovators, Some Problems Awaiting Solutions. Uh, and he talked about lightning bulbs and cars and all this other stuff being really incredible, but that he also predicted that we would run out of resources. He said, you can take the coal out of the mine, but you can't put it back. So he started talking about solar panels in 1917. I mean, that's incredible, right? And you think about what we do today, and you know, I think about my experiences showing up here, and, and we came up with tools that we'd pull from other places, you know, like things like crowdsourcing to find uh, the tomb of Genghis Khan, potentially. And then we ended up using satellite imagery and going and using that out all over the world. And, and when Malaysia Airlines lost their plane, eight million people got together in a single weekend to sift through satellite imagery. The power of just coming up with an idea isn't saying that you're going to tinker and, and engineer. It's that you're going to think of how to apply things in really novel ways, right? More recently, uh, after spending a lot of time in Guatemala where I was working on things, I heard Corey say traditional photogrammetry. I was like, man, that's traditional now? I mean, this is when, like, that was really novel at one point. I guess I'm traditional. Uh, but during this time, we were mapping the inside of caves with, with camera phones and Xbox Connects. And in the midst of all that, I lost my leg. Things changed. And I realized all of a sudden I had a new perspective into a community of people that was 40 million large. People just like me, but that can't, they can't afford something that'll fit to their body. So what did we do? We came up with a solution where we could just take anybody's cell phone, all of your cell phones, and use the same technology we had in Guatemala to map the inside of tunnels and print people's lives back. So the idea essentially is that now, when you take a photo, you're not just taking a photo of a moment, you're capturing the ability to transport somebody's body to a place where they can have a series of, of innovations happen that allow them to print back a piece of hardware that could literally give them their lives back. This is just one of many examples of how people and groups in this room can come together and find totally new ideas by having these conversations. And the point of this panel, I think, uh, in, in all the panels that we have, is to see how we can apply the different concepts that are about to be described to solve the greatest challenges that we face. Because now we sit on the brink of disaster, and yet it will be our imagination that gives us hope. Engineering, solutions, technology, all this, it's just imagination. Literally everything you see in this room was imagined first before it became reality. So let me bring out the panel, starting us off, We've got an incredible panel. Jonathan, and we've got Martin, we've got Topher, and we have Peg. Thank you guys. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's jump right in. I've got uh, Jonathan Giddens is incredible. She's, uh, she's spent a career caring about the ocean. Uh, she actually began, now she's doing deep sea indexes with drop cams, but she began her career looking at, uh, at near shore work, you know, the impact of 
invasive species or introduced species on nearshore coral reefs. And so what you might not know is that she also was formally trained as an artist. And her work has been not just about applying technology, but about figuring out where, as she put it, is she can move the dial in human consciousness. Uh, so please take it away. Oh, you have your own? Nope. There you go. Yeah, I need yours. <laughs> Innovation. <laughs> OK. Thank you. So we are mostly water, as is our ocean planet. And the native Hawaiians actually link their ancestry back to the ocean itself, so that we're not just connected to all living beings and the beings of the earth and connected to the ocean, but we're actually younger cousins of these beings. Um, behind me is a painting of the Kumulipo, the Hawaiian creation chant, and it illustrates that life first came from the deep, dark ocean, and this chant sings about life coming into being from the coral polyp to the sea star, to the urchin and the fish, and finally human beings come. And in this way, we're all connected to all these living beings, but also to the ocean itself. So this is why I love Hawaii, because I feel at home on and in the water, as I'm sure that I share that feeling with many of you, whether it be the water, the, the rivers, the trees, the mountains, it's that feeling of being at home. So I started to, uh, this feeling brought me from Massachusetts to Hawaii to study coral reef fish, even though I'm entirely looking in the wrong direction in this picture. <laughs> but with, the core, with scuba diving, we can only see so far just a thin fraction of this ocean planet. We need innovative solutions to get, help us get past that physical barrier to be able to see the deep sea that we are, we are physically limited from seeing. We heard from Bob Ballard, there's so much more to explore. And what's dangerous about not knowing what's down there is that the whole planet is undergoing this massive change. So if we can't see it, identify it, and know how to, how to help protect it, then these could silently vanish, and we won't let that happen. So to address this problem, National Geographic's Exploration Technology Lab developed the Deep Ocean Drop Cam, which is a high-definition camera encased in a pressure housing. So how it works is it's a free fall camera, and it's attached to a weight, which brings it down to the, sur to the bottom, where it's anchored to the bottom, and it surveys the benthos, the bottom of the ocean. It has its own lights and reflectors to illuminate the scene. This can go as deep as the ocean goes. And it's programmed to record for a number of hours, and when it's done recording, there's a burn wire that dissolves and lets it free and lets it go up to the surface where it sends a signal to the ship to come and pick it up, and that's how it's located. And in this way, we've been able to get massive amounts already of video footage from these extremely remote locations. So this is a map of where this drop cam has already been deployed, and this is largely from the pristine seas effort that you heard about from the leader, Enrique Sala, yesterday. And so already we've, we have this data from across the globe, and we're just getting started. So what's incredible about this technology is that it's just so, it's lightweight and it's uh, so deployable that otherwise it would just be so expensive to get this kind of data from all around the world. So now we're, we have this massive array. So my work is to help transform this innovative technology into an active research program to assess biodiversity in the deep sea. And these biodiversity and other metrics will go into the first global assessment of deep sea ocean health. And it all starts with the video footage, so I'll show you a little bit of the process. This is from about 2,000 meters depth off of Niue Atoll in the Pacific. And so these are some of the creatures that we see down there, the chimera relative of the shark, the deep water cod here, and it's just incredible to be able to see these species in their natural environment that we otherwise would never be able to see. Um, so what I do with this video is I ID the species present, 
and count them up and get a measure of community diversity. This is the first Galapagos shark that was identified at Niue Atoll. So actually these videos, about one in 20 drops will reveal a new undescribed species or a range expansion. <laughs> so these you're seeing, um, these are deep water snappers and groupers, which are also important food fish for the people of Niue. So it's just incredible to get this type of information. So then what I do is take that data and put it into maps to be able to look at regional differences for these drops. So we're looking at deep sea species richness, a measure of biodiversity where the bigger bubbles are more biodiverse. So in this way, we can identify areas of high conservation value, these diversity hotspots. Also, we can look at this map in relation to global fishing effort um, or mining claims to see what areas might be at risk of overexploitation or disturbance. And so we can begin to identify areas for protection. So learning from the Hawaiians, we are not separate from the the ocean, we are very much related to it, and we need to bring these deep ecosystems, this dark realm, into the minds of people everywhere. So we need this innovative technology to go past our physical limitations and represent these species for everybody to share. So please follow us as we embark on this exciting exploration of the deep sea. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was, that was really beautiful. Uh, now, jumping from the ocean to uh, the air and to the land, uh, we've got Martin Wachelski, who's the director of ornithology at the Max Planck Institute in Konstanz, Germany. I first learned about his work uh, with him at a, when he was giving his Emerging Explorer talk years ago, and was blown away by the way in which he could create tools that could allow us to see the movements of insects at scale and to actually attach something to insects that could then map where they're going. I mean, it was really I mean, one of the most mind-blowing experiences of my life. And now I'm super excited to welcome him back to the stage because now we get to see, after all that sensing, what they found. Please, thank you. Well, thanks a lot. So um, it's actually interesting that we now want to take technology and uh, uh, allow animals to communicate with us, communicate with them, and have them tell us how they see the world. And uh, it's very exciting because we now understand that uh, collectives of animals give us information about the environment that we didn't have before. They are actually our best sensors. They are evolved sensors. They're better than any technology we have, and we want to um, have them communicate with us. Um, we can do that on a small scale, on a local scale with insects. Uh, Start so geglückt. National Geographic, uh, John wow. Francis, uh, 15, 20 years ago, gave us the first funding for that. Uh, we can now do it with solar panels. Um, but we also get people to buy in and, and uh, go out and see these, these birds that are tagged. Uh, this was just a few days ago that we got this information. Um, we have that all around the world now, and we have probably about a billion GPS points of animals moving around um, on the globe just on the terrestrial side. But the problem was that we had no way to um, communicate with small animals on a global scale. For example, these quileas, uh, one of the big um, problems in Africa, but also big uh, ecosystem service agents. How can we do that? Well, um, we built a big antenna system. Uh, this took us actually 16 years. It's uh, pretty complicated. It's the Internet of Things via satellite. Uh, this is something that nobody else can do except uh, we, we are doing that right now from small tags. The 15th of August, so in a few weeks, we'll have the spacewalk. It's a seven-hour spacewalk uh, uh, to fix this antenna to the International Space Station. We launched it a few weeks ago when it was still minus 25 in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. Um, it's now up there. It's sitting in the uh, progress capsule and uh, being fixed to the outside, as I said, in a seven-hour spacewalk, um, huge antenna system that will allow us to have small tags, basic tags, leg bands that we can ju just attach to large animals, fish tags, or ear tags, so no collars anymore, but ear tags, or some advanced tags that have more sensors in there. 
Now they also have all kinds of sensors that tell us about the environment, but also the state of the animal, so the behavior of the animal. But this can also be attached to animals like uh, these gorillas, uh, these uh, orangs that wait for rehabilitation, um, or uh, fish in the ocean. So what can we do with that? Well, uh, we can ask animals, how do you see the world? Uh, we can test this with geese. We let them fly, train them uh, to fly next to our glider, measure the air with our glider, but also on the goose, and then can really understand um, the aerial movements, the atmospheric chemistry, the atmosphere itself. Um, and not only here, but in the Himalayas or in the Greenland ice shield, so anywhere around the planet, these animals can tell us what they see. Uh, they can also tell us where emerging diseases are. Uh, we sent the, the flying foxes around to Africa to find out where Ebola hides. Uh, and they are all over the place. There are about 100 million of those individuals across Africa, and they have, they're doing important ecosystem services. Uh, we can also try to understand what animals sense about the environment ahead of catastrophes. Uh, we learned about the elephants that knew about the tsunami 14 years ago in Banda Aceh. Uh, we tagged a bunch of those elephants. Uh, in these areas nowadays, you can't even um, see that there was a catastrophe, but uh, 14 years ago, it was horrible, as you all know. Uh, some of these elephants walked away before the tsunami came. Uh, we tried to understand how they know, but the problem obviously is you're always behind schedule because hopefully there's not the next tsunami, but you go into areas where you are expecting some. Um, so what we did recently was to go to Mount Etna, uh, study animals that the herders, they are told us, are really sensitive, but also to the um, seismic areas, to the um, areas in Italy that uh, were exposed to the big earthquakes. Um, we tagged domestic animals, the same methods, and what we found is that um, um, the collective of animals, not individuals, but the collective actually tells us up to 18 hours ahead of time where and when these uh, earthquakes may come. So that's something that we are now trying to do with our seismolo seism seismology colleagues around the rim of fire around the world. But one of the most important aspects, obviously, is we want to learn about animals to conserve them, to help them. Uh, we get these pictures back from, in this case, Syria, from our storks. Uh, people email us and say, well, sorry, we had to kill your animals. Um, we're hungry and we need peace, um, but uh, please understand us. Totally understandable. But what we want to do is um, capitalize on the ideas of um, individualizing conservation. Uh, Cecil the Lion, I think, is uh, uh, an icon in that field. has been a big um, issue um, a while ago. Our colleagues in Oxford, uh, Dave McDonald, who tracked these animals, is on board, and we are trying to uh, do this on a larger scale with all these tagged animals now. Uh, for example, we have today, um, this year, going out um, to about uh, 30 places around the world uh, where we tag 1,000 cranes, 1,000 young cranes. And if you look at these two little ones that uh, are tagged there, they get electronic leg bands. And they actually fly from Mongolia to Beijing, across the Annapurna, seven and a half thousand meter altitude to Pakistan and back through all the Stan countries to Mongolia. Uh, the other population, same species, the Moselle cranes go down the danger countries uh, um, through Sudan, Ethiopia, and so on. So this is something that we get this year for a thousand animals and really get a, a picture um, around the globe. Because it is dangerous for those um, birds to fly through the deserts there. Now, people can participate. Everybody, we, we need citizen science to help us really observe these animals because we can't be at these places where all these animals are. Um, and the good thing is we now also get help from space. So our German astronaut, who is actually the commander of the space station soon, <laughs> um, has taken not this bird, but a, 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 a toy blackbird up with him uh, and will instruct the kids in Europe uh, to please take care of your animals, and this is how we can observe them from space. Uh, this is really what we want to do in the future. We want to link the animals up. We want to understand what they tell us about uh, the environment and what the collective of animals can tell us more than single animals, and that's being uh, called the Internet of Animals. I told you. I love that term. It's mind-blowing. It literally is mind-blowing, and I'm sure uh, 
a few years from now, we'll get another update that will be equally increasingly mind-blowing. So thank you for that. Next up, uh, from the movement of animals, we have, uh, we have somebody that's really on the front lines. Uh, Topher White is somebody I've known for a long time and I've respected uh, both as a friend but also as almost like a warrior. You know, every time he shows up to anywhere where we are, he's covered in dirt. Uh, he's, he, he's grabbed, he grabs a white shirt out of it, stuffed in his backpack and throws it on and gets on the stage. But it's because he is, you know, I'm just saying. Uh, but it's because he literally just lands from somewhere like the Amazon where he's been helping the Tembe people uh, protect these trees through innovation. Uh, you know, from looking at the, the idea that there's, there's logging and there's poaching happening out there, he took a perspective, having grown up, I think, in the Bay Area, right? Yeah. Uh, that that there was a solution which could change the game and give the local people an empowerment to actually stop this activity. Uh, and I think he's been doing some really exciting work now, going even further to scale it up uh, because of the immense engineering challenges that he faces. So next up is Topher White. Thanks. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to stand here and take credit for the work of a whole team uh, that I work with at Rainforest Connection. Uh, we're a, a pretty small startup out in San Francisco, a nonprofit startup, uh, really focused on ways that we can stop deforestation uh, in the rainforest and protect these, these, these amazing environments. Um, and one of the best ways to do that, uh, if you look at kind of the, the Amazon as an example, uh, illegal logging makes up about 90 to 15 to 90 percent of all the logging that takes place in the rainforest. And even though uh, you know, deforestation is not all logging, uh, it's the roads that are created by illegal logging that are such a big issue. So in this case, it's so profitable to cut down trees illegally that they'll cut these roads through the forest, and then once there's a road there, really just within a few years, that one road can destroy the whole forest around it, as you see here. So in many ways, stopping illegal logging could be one of the fastest uh, and cheapest ways to fight climate change based on, um, on all the uh, emissions that come from deforestation, as well as uh, deal with social issues there on the ground. Uh, so that's kind of what we're setting out to do with technology. Um, but it's important to point out at the end of the day that it's really people on the ground. So, you know, the moment a chainsaw goes off in the forest, it can be picked up, uh, the sound picked up by a device up in a tree, goes to the cloud, does some magic stuff on the cloud, sends um, an alert over the standard cell phone network to the, to the rangers who can actually um, get up out in there and stop them uh, on the spot in real time. That's possible because, you know, there's cell phone networks, there's rangers on the ground who would make um, uh, a difference if they, if they could, but really walking through the forest and trying to find loggers is really not a feasible thing to do. Um, but again, uh, you know, there's a device up in the tree. Old cell phones are a pretty great way to accomplish this. They're thrown away by the hundreds of millions every year. Uh, we can put them in a box with a microphone and some solar panels, and they can last for a long time. Uh, really just, uh, just sort of taking that out. So this is how it sort of comes together uh, in, um, in, uh, in the garage. You can see it's very high tech stuff. Um, uh, but let's really take it out to the field. So it's one thing to be in San Francisco and do this. Um, so let's go to the Amazon. Here we have the Tembe tribe. Uh, you can see an ocean deforestation with these uh, islands of pretty intact forest. Um, those are actually indigenous reserves. And one of them is of the Tembe tribe here, uh, this, uh, this red area right here. This is the Tembe uh, tribe. There's like 1,500 of them left. Um, and this, uh, this entire purple area in 2014 was occupied by illegal loggers, illegal settlers, uh, drug cartels. Uh, and the Tembe were stuck um, on these two sides. Um, so they really just realized that it was an existential challenge for them. And this is similar to situations you see all over the world with people on the ground, not governments, uh, but NGOs, tribes, who, uh, who would actually uh, fight back and take responsibility for that. Fortunately for that, the Tembe um, you know, were pretty, uh, pretty well armed. They, uh, they, they trained, 15, whoop, trained 15 rangers to, uh, to be able to respond. And we figured that we would, uh, we would sort of team up with them. But it wasn't just the ability to go off and respond to these, uh, respond to these threats. It was also that they, they took on some technical expertise as well. So this is, um, this is Elivar, he's the, he's the son of uh, the chief Naldo out there, uh, learning how to put together this, uh, this remote acoustic sensor uh, out of an old phone. Uh, it's really hot there, you guys. It's pretty sweaty. Old cell phones or and uh, put it into a box. But then, uh, you know, how do we use the cell phone networks? Because these things are pretty far away. Well, we climb high in trees. Uh, and it's best to actually teach the Tembe how to do that, too. So this is Elivar climbing about 150 feet up a tree uh, and sawing one of these things um, on a road uh, where there was uh, known to be some entry of illegal logging trucks. And based on that, you can pick up a cell phone signal from, like, really far away. Um, so uh, basically, at the end of the day, it is about these, uh, these chainsaws go off, phone picks it up, goes to the cloud, um, and then you send an alert. So what that actually looks like, for example, uh, in this area, when you pick up a sound, uh, can we have the 
Okay, here we go. Can we turn this one up, maybe? Yeah, okay, so who can hear the chainsaw? You can hear the chainsaw. Cool, so this is actually machine learning. This is, um, this is artificial intelligence that's uh, searching this thing. This one's pretty easy. No one's gonna listen to all the sounds of the forest, but this one's pretty easy. Uh, this next one, though, is an actual alert from the Tembe land. If you can hear the chainsaw, here, raise your hand. You can turn it up, maybe. Still, all right, well, that's awesome, Claire. All right. Uh, still, AI can still pick this out. And so um, they're able to pick this thing out of a forest, even though it's very, very uh, noisy and very far away. This, uh, in this case, the Tembe was able to lead to, um, the Tembe got about two dozen rangers together, put them in the end of the road. They were able to, um, turn the sound on, uh, intercept the logging truck on the way out. And, uh, and uh, on the other end of that logging truck, they actually burned the truck. These guys stole, uh, they basically um, seized all the equipment. And this is an amazing example of, uh, of really badass guys off in the field who can take care of this, uh, this protection of these forests for us, simply by protecting their land if they have an edge. Um, but it's not just about people in the field. This is really important. But sometimes it's about attention as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, finding ways to make use of this uh, this data. It's one thing to be able to take, you know, machine learning and pull things out. It's also pretty important, you know, sometimes to be able to come up with solutions for the rest of us. So, for example, you know, we have uh, these live streaming apps in the store. Every single phone that's in the tree uh, can actually send all the data up to the cloud, and you can listen live to every single one of these stations that's out there. It's important to find ways to get the, the public involved. Um, and interested in that. Uh, but beyond that, look, it's not just about chainsaws, because luckily there's like a lot of other stuff happening in the forest. So if you catch loggers uh, a couple times in the places we've been, uh, you know, and you catch them a couple times, they'll go away for like a season. Uh, and that's good news, except that we're monitoring it the entire time. What can we do with that? Well, it's super noisy, and there's a lot of biodiversity out there. So uh, let's go to Sumatra, one of the, the other projects, and take a look at what's out there. So you know, we, we maintain all these web tools and consoles for our partners and for the rest uh, that show these alerts. Um, but uh, one of the most amazing new things we have out there is the ability to, to uh, look at biodiversity. So when you see this spectrogram, can we turn the sound on? You can see all this activity on the spectrogram, like what's happening there. Uh, but for a person to go through that, uh, ecologists and biologists, they've had to go through this stuff manually for, for so, so long. Um, but here we are analyzing all this audio, these decades of audio. These, you know, we have 17, uh, sorry, 70 years of audio already in our system. Pretty soon we'll have centuries as we go to more places. Um, and so to have the computers themselves actually pull out the different species, uh, and this is a really cool feature that I'm just uh, excited to show you guys now, the ability for this thing to automatically look at real-time data coming in from the field and pull out all these things uh, that are actually within it. Uh, you see there is a vehicle. So just turn it up and I'll show it too. So just within this sound, you know, there's at least a few major insects. Uh, there's uh, gibbons. Um, some birds, and, uh, and really the ability for this AI to pick all these things out. And what's great about this is when all these species interact, what you tend to see is that that's real ecology. You can have computers scanning through and looking for patterns and correlations between them. Uh, in the past, this has been something that the data scientists had to do, but we're also releasing a tool very soon that'll allow anybody to just go through, circle what they're looking for. It'll automatically train detections and scan through the entire data set. So we hope these are tools that are really um, come in handy for people not just for scientists uh, or data scientists, but for ecologists that can make a difference um, without a background in computer science. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, yes, we do have a box with a solar panel and a phone inside, but the phone is almost all that matters. And so the next step for us is uh, getting rid of everything that's around it, making sure that everybody, whether it's in the rainforest or in your backyard or anywhere else, can just put your phone on a windowsill and have access to all this, in this information and this intelligence, um, intelligent algorithms about what's happening in, uh, around the world on the outside. Thanks. Thank you, Topher. So next up, and I know we're gonna get a bunch of cheers from all the teachers in the room. Uh, <laughs> let's just do it. We've got Peg Kiner. So she's incredible. She's got a lot of titles, uh, including Director of Innovation and Gems in the World Academy in Chicago. Uh, she's also a, a Global Goal Ambassador for the UN uh, chapter in, in Chicago. And maybe most importantly, she's one of their 2017 Limbad, Limblad uh, Expedition Grosner uh, Teacher Fellows. Uh, but when I think of Topher's work as him being a warrior in the field, I think that Peg is maybe, I would, I'd say like a, the general, uh, you know? I'll take it. Yeah, she's the general. Uh, because what she's doing is she's, you know, we talked about imagination, but what she's doing, she's, she's creating agency in a population 
that will make decisions that won't only affect you know, the next 40 years or so, but because of all the planetary boundaries that we face, may affect the next 10,000 years or more. Uh, so to tell us how she's training that army to feel the empowerment to make that difference that we all need them to do to imagine a better world and then make it so, here's Peg. Thanks. So you heard from Albert, I'm Peg Kiner, the Director of Innovation at GEMS World Academy Chicago, but I really like to think of myself as the Director of What If. But my students have a lot of other titles for me. They call me the computer lady or the iPad lady. And since becoming a National Geographic Grosvenor Teacher Fellow, a Lindblad Expeditions Grosvenor Teacher Fellow, my students now call me the penguin lady. <laughs> but I remind them, I too was once a child once. And the most important thing that any adult did for me was invite me to solve a complex problem. And in my family, that complex problem happened to be our home computer. <laughs> I still remember the feeling of opening up that computer and seeing the green circuit board, putting that component inside. That's a real power. We have real power to understand systems. There is power in understanding systems and the interconnected parts when we know that, we can know we can make change. I have devoted my life and my career to making sure that teachers and students use technology as a raw material to understand the world because I want to give every single student that feeling of empowerment. Some of the tools that I use to help my students get there are these boards, and these are called circuit blocks. They're wooden circuit blocks. That feeling I had as a youngster didn't go away. When I was in eighth grade, they started pulling me out of classrooms to fix the computers. <laughs> That's when I realized that in having this skill, this is a skill that could help people. And I wanted to devote my life to helping people, as many people, as soon as possible. So I knew the only thing to do was to become a teacher. I would like to share with you some of the tools that I use to help uncover systems in our classrooms. This tool is a circuit block, so uh, all three of these components fit together, and students as young as preschool can work on these pieces and use their hands to hold those alligator clips and figure out which tool is the best to use. There is power in understanding how a button works. Another tool that we use to bring our immersive environments back into the classroom is called a bare conductive touch board. What I do is even in the field, and some explorers have shared their audio with me today, I place audio on that tiny board in there, and then I create these immersive environments for students. On the right side, you see that there is an ocean, and this is preschool classroom. They're studying animals, and we created an ocean experience for them. The students drew whales and other animals they were investigating. I found the audio for them, and was able to connect their drawings using conductive paint. As the students investigated the environment and became explorers, they touched their own paintings to hear the sounds of the ocean. I want to use technology to bring and immerse our students in places they might never go. Already I had an explorer share their audio with me, and come this fall we'll have a Peruvian Amazon in our own first grade hallway. Another tool I use is actually a thinking routine. This is from Harvard Education, and the project is Project Zero, which some of you may know from Paul Salopek's work from Out of Eden. There's another project, and that's called Agency by Design. This is a thinking routine to help students uncover systems, and it's called Parts, Purposes, and Complexities. The hardest part about teaching this is finding tools and finding objects that still have screws. Things are just meant to be thrown away. And we need students to understand how these complex systems work. 
This thinking routine is just the beginning because in order for us to understand these systems, we need these thinking routines to understand the complex systems that all of you uncover. Another tool we use as we help students move from parts, purposes, and complexities into empowering them to gather information about their environment, it's called Hummingbird. This is a circuit board that allows students to connect sensors. They decide what they want to investigate in their world. It could be air quality, temperature, humidity. They put those sensors in and they can create an object to give them that information. They're intentionally deciding both the input and the output. In our classrooms, this has become a stop on the Silk Road, this has become a storytelling tool and an air quality sensor in the class. We want to make sure that students have the choice to create the object they need to investigate the world. Beyond creating our own sensors and our own tools for discovery, we want to bring students and zoom them out to a wider focus. Beyond the local, we have to acknowledge the global, and we know that these tools help us see the change over time. I work very closely with the Carnegie Mellon CREATE Lab. CREATE stands for Community Robotics Education and Technology Empowerment. And they use NASA data from 1984 to 2016, satellite data that allows students to see this change over time. This is an inquiry tool for them to investigate and see what has happened. This is not normal, but this tool lets us see what those changes are. Another tool that helps us see the changes in our environment is Because Learning. They have sensors, and we had a special project with them and the Association of Space Explorers. We sent an experiment into space, and we're able to collect data and use CODAP, which stands for um, Collect Common Online Data Analysis Platform. What was great about this tool was that students could touch, they could have all of the sensors they were looking at and touch it on the map. We want data analysis tools that are inviting to students so they can keep going further. As I prepare to become a Lindblad Expedition's National Geographic Grosvenor Teacher Fellow, I wanted to make sure my students understood the context of Antarctica. Most Mercator projections won't let them see the full scope and scale of that place, but I use Google Tour Builder as a way to create the path. I put in my pictures and show them how we get there and then put it into Google Earth as this three-dimensional tool for them to truly see the scale. The thing that I learned from this experience after collecting my information and bringing it back, I was very focused on collecting 360 video and audio. I was so excited to present it in front of my kindergarten students. And as soon as I showed them the images, they said, I heard them say, where are you? I said, I'm in Antarctica. And they said, no, 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 where are you? I had to create media that included me in the image to get the students to emotionally connect to the tool. They, through this, this is actually using Google's new Poly tool, using 360 images. Students can go on their own tour. When I showed this to second grade, there were shrieks in the room when they saw my face. They could see themselves as an explorer. They see themselves and they care for the environment because they have an emotional connection to it now. Explorers I implore you, if we are going to help students become those transformative leaders to help us put our planet in balance, we need to show them the process. We need to uncover the systems. If you are interested in sharing your stories of your process of your tools, please contact me in our Explorer community. We need to know the how. Beyond your results, what is so important that we hear about is your resilience. Thank you. A round of applause for everybody. Wow, you guys are, you guys are really doing incredible work. Uh, I've, uh, I've every year been blown away by the innovations that come online to be able to see the world, see what's happening, and it's important. But I think you brought up a really good, everybody brought up a good point about this idea of empathy and caring uh, and connecting. One thing that I also know is that it seems like there's a cacophony 
you know, that's coming out now. Uh, like a, just the amount, the volume, the sheer volume of information that there is to source. And in the world that we live in today, our data streams are becoming increasingly tribal, right? It's like, I read once that on Wired it said that the web is dead in a cover article. And what they meant was that nobody goes to any new websites anymore. You go to a couple that they've already chosen that they're gonna go to forever. And you get closer and closer into these little channels. Now we have an incredible community uh, here in the room and also online. It's really remarkable. We reach an audience that's so broad. Uh, but how do we take on the challenge of actually getting the salient stuff into the hearts and minds of, uh, of the world at large? And what do you think about, and this is really for anybody, what do you think about the challenge uh, that we face in terms of turning data into something that you're emotionally driven by when there's just so much data? Anybody? I'll start. Um, I think that it's going off a peg that it's uh, just a question of turning all that information, all those little pixels, all that, and turning it into a story via a character. And all, all cultures, all people, everybody can connect with a story, um, a be you know, a challenge, a solution, and a resolution. Uh, a beginning, a middle, and an end. So you kind of go on that journey and you come up with a lesson at the end of it. And that's the same for everybody. It's something that really connects us all. So I think that's one way of bringing meaning um, out of the cacophony of data and what are the lessons that we want to teach with that mm -hmm. and having that character and having something that you can actually connect with. A character, you mean like a, like a person, a hero? A hero. Yeah, right. I mean, I definitely see that in everybody, everybody here, right? Uh, and then, and then, how does that, how do, like, how do we broaden the reach of those heroes? I mean, the thing is that we can't keep preaching to the choir, right? Uh, so, how do we bring in people that you wouldn't expect, with communities that you wouldn't expect to care, and turn them into the heroes? Um, I think I think social media has taught us um, a few things, but one of them is that everyone is their own hero in a certain way, and everyone is uh, is their, their their own narrative is is really very impactful on them and their friends. So if you can make what's, what you're trying to get across about, about them and about their journey, uh, they're much more likely to, to follow it and to, mm. to bring it in. And there are aspects of almost everything that can be, um, that can, mm. that people can feel ownership of, I'd say. I'm gonna switch gears for a moment uh, and, and think about, back to this idea of agency. Uh, you know, one question I get from a lot of people is how did you end up with Natural? How did you end up getting on this platform uh, with, this, with this yellow border around you. And, and, it, and it really has been an incredible platform. Uh, and in general, there's many ideas in the world. You take one walk down Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley, and you will learn that ideas are a dime a dozen. But it's making them happen that really counts. So can you tell me a story, any, any, your story of, uh, of the moment that you actually were able to get your breakthrough, your, your breakout, I mean, like your breakaway moment to actually get beyond that cacophony of noise and, and get your, your spotlight to tell your story? Was there a single moment in your life where you can call somebody patting you on the back and saying go? Say, yeah, um, I became involved in National Geographic because I went to a hackathon for Google and Google Earth and National Geographic together. Uh, and that's when I learned about all the opportunities available to educators everywhere. Um, so I would say my big break was definitely uh, an application I found online and the continued relationship with supportive partners. Mm. Anybody else? Uh, I, was, I was lucky to be in, a, in the, the right place at, um, at uh, like way too late, I guess. Uh, you know. <laughs> way too late. Uh, I was, I'd been like building these, uh, you know, phone apps for my friend out in San Francisco from afar, but uh, but I was out in the middle of nowhere in Indonesia, volunteering at a Gidden Reserve, and realized that you know there was cell phone service, and uh, and I had like ten old phones in my backpack. But you be good, you were so. volunteering out there to begin with. Wait. Yeah, I was volunteering there just like as a vacation, uh, and uh, and I'd been volunteering there and realized that they uh, that they had this problem with legal logging, and they were spending all their time trying to catch illegal loggers, but. Um, but uh, I had a few old phones, and it seemed like much better use for them than, than the app I was building for sports marketing for my friend back in San Francisco.
I have a story. <laughs> I was in high school. I was in trouble. I was in the library where they put the people who were in trouble. And somebody <laughs> came to give a talk at our high school. It was a man by the name of Robert Ballard. And uh, Bob. 20 years ago, he came to talk. And it was a small group. And I think I was on, I was either on the floor, just floored by what he had to say, or I was jumping up and down in my seat, just felt like the universe had just exploded above me. And all of a sudden, the sky was wide open. And then I went, he was giving a talk later. That, and so I went back to see him. And I was jumping up and down. My mom said that I have never been the same since. And talk about a breakthrough moment. It's taken me 20 years, and now I got to walk through that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. I feel like I'm going to cry. You know? <laughs> well, I'd say uh, the most transformative is really looking into the eye of the kids, eyes of the kids that, for the first time, really understand what their animals are doing throughout the entire year. You know, usually, say a stork in, in Europe, you can see it well. It sits on a on a building or sits on a, on a pasture, but then when they can follow it throughout the entire time. They see what they do in Africa and how they cross Gibraltar and how they go through the Middle East. And, and the kids really start to understand that, especially with the modern tools. They can live with these animals, with their, their wild pets. I think that's really amazing. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's, it, is, it, is, it comes back down to the kids. Right? And I've got two little kids myself. So we recently uh, showed the film Jane to them. And, uh, and then Jane was kind enough to send in a video saying, good job, kids, on their conservation effort. And you can see the kids, these second graders, start crying. Uh, because of the power of leadership and mentorship and just seeing a hero. It goes back to that hero idea. Um, now there's a, a slightly you know, crazy thing, which is that I was down in that, that office of Alexander Graham Bell, and, uh, and I picked up the telephone, and it didn't work. <laughs> you know, it wasn't even plugged in. Uh, because nobody needs landlines anymore, and now we've got you know, these things that we call phones, but really they're supercomputers in our pockets. Uh, and Mark Weissner and, and John Brown once described this, this thing called comm technology, which is coming, they, they think, about, think about 100 years from now. Because that office was you know, something that was occupied uh, 100 years, 130 years before. We're at this middle point. So 130 years from now, uh, what do you see being your dream in terms of how you would use technology? Calm technology, they describe as it's just invisible. It exists everywhere. You, like you don't even have a phone. It, your, your information pops up, and you need it, it disappears, it goes, all these different things. And as we get to that moment where technology becomes less obstructive uh, and more everywhere, uh, how do we turn that into something which can actually move the the needle on, on this major challenge we have, which is to basically care for the pulse of the planet. I, I could start by saying, uh, amongst many possible outcomes in 130 years, uh, with the connectivity that, that we have and, and uh, focus on, on experiences, uh, it actually could be feasible for us to you know, leave half of the planet to, to wild space, because people won't have to go to all these places to experience them, but they will have an appreciation for potentially why they matter. Uh, if we can make them interesting. Making what's happening where someone else, where someone is not, is, uh, is, a, is a challenge always. Um, but uh, everyone should be able to appreciate the rainforest without actually having to go there or anywhere. Yeah, like what if your clothes ended up being a projection of the rainforest or something like that, and it morphs around? I mean, think really out of the box here. Let's, let's go 100 years from now. Nice. You know, hoverboards, that sort of thing. Get back to the future here. Like, what are we going to see? <laughs> what are the cutting edge solutions when you can get beyond all these little things that we think of as technology innovations now? Well, I think the most amazing is that we can tap into the knowledge of animals around the globe. And you know, they know everything about the planet if you take them together as a collective. And we learn that these collectives are really functional. I mean, if you take a, a, a herd of wildebeest or a column migrating, then the ones at the end know how the grass is in the front, and it's 80 miles down. And they know it through sort of this, this information that trickles through this herd. And that's just one species in one area, but connect them all. And mm. you know, you'll, you'll have a feeling of how this planet works. And that's what National Lab is, uh, the National Geo Labs is putting together. I think they are, they're really on the right track. Wow. Yeah. Good job, Nat Geo Labs. Yeah. <laughs>
Or is Fabian? Is Fabian in the room anyway? Yeah, their, their whole team. It's really incredible. <laughs> I, re I remember when they uh, when we were just playing around with the first drop cam way way long ago, and Eric Berkham passed. I was like. This thing looks interesting, and then it blew up and broke, and he showed this video of it in the ocean, and it just smashes into itself, and you know, that was 10 years ago. And, and now, you're using it to create this network all over the world. What do you see being the, the innovation that you would use 100 years from now? Imagine it, the time machine. Wow, time machine. I guess, yeah, without having to even use these, uh, just getting smaller and smaller, I think, and somehow be able to f be fully immersed in feel what it's like to be underwater under all that pressure, you know, instead of waiting for the video to come back up and to just see what I see, but um, project more senses, not just eyes, but feeling what is that, what are the sounds and the feeling, and to be able to sense like the animal's sense. The feeling. There's a lot of, yeah, sorry. Sorry, go on. Oh, no. I just knew in the, if we can increase connectivity, not only through bandwidth, but also emotion through any tool, I think that's how we are really going to create that transformative movement of change. So as I hope that the future includes, and I know it will, with Nat Geo Labs and a lot of the new stuff coming out, more tools for us to emotionally connect to this world. I want to smell the rainforest. Can you send smells over the phone next time? You, know, you really don't want to smell the rainforest. <laughs> <laughs> I can help you listen to it. Yeah, exactly. I've spent time with the rain. It smells amazing. It's so punch and beautiful. And, you know. I got to go where you're going, man. Um, <laughs> no, I think transparency is, uh, is, is a very broad, vague term. But transparency is, is, is huge because um, you know, great injustice and you know, great damage and honestly, environmental crime, amongst other things, uh, it happens in the shadows. And so mm. if transparency can. Um, you know, there, there are always probably more benefits to it than, than otherwise. So, you know, if you can connect people through emotions, if you can connect people through, uh, through seeing what's out there, um, it's very important. And Martin and I are always going to come with better ways to spy on birds, <laughs> whether it's through sound or... <laughs> but can I, I pick up on the smell? Because I think that's really important. We are so bad in making smell conscious. And we're doing a project uh, measuring the smell of Tuscany or other places and how the animals use that. And it's really amazing. They know their map of the landscape by smell. And it smells differently in different places. Wow. And we all know that. I mean, if we go back home to whatever, grandma, and it smells like the old uh, cake, uh, I mean, yeah. it's this deep feeling. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that we should also include. In we should do that, baby. And smell, the smell right. machine. Hello, Watson, come here. I want to smell you. <laughs> do that. Well, we have a couple of minutes. I think we should open it up to the audience. Uh, there's a lot of innovators in this room. I see Shah Selby and, and others and, and all these different innovators. I remember spending time with uh, you know, the, the Joubert talking about wireless fences, are, are there, and, and then the future innovators all across the board. So uh, are there any questions from the audience or thoughts? There's got to be one. You must have a question. No? <laughs> well, what's that? There's next one. Hey, there's a mic over here. Well, if you'd like. Maybe just info for the amazing uh, work you're doing with students. Um, I, one of the greatest innovations, I saw, I'm Megan Smith. I was the chief technology officer for the US uh, under President Obama. Um, and one of the, we got to see so many amazing innovations like what you're doing. It's just astonishing. And uh, one of the things we found was that uh, in Arizona, they started electing chief science officer children. Mm -hmm. And so there's 150 Phoenix-based middle school and high school chief science officers, and they have two jobs. One of them is get people in school to be into STEM and tech and understand why it's cool. And second, do something in your community that matters that you're interested in doing together with your friends using STEM and tech. And they have a summer institute, and they um, teach each other how to how, how do you speak on TV, how do you write a blog, how do because they're already science kids. They're also elected by their peers when they run the uh, you know the school president and and treasurer stuff. Uh, that election they run this, and so they're totally diverse and gender balanced and fabulous. And now that's spread to Michigan and a couple of those places. There are about 500 in the U.S. And there's Kuwait has just joined, and so has Canada. So. Uh, I find them to be the fastest path to changing STEM in a school, and for them to have a mentor of all of you, but especially um, maybe one of the programs we could teach all of them, which I'd love to do with you, is how to do a mural with all the kids in school, in every school where there's a CSO, and then make it interactive in your way. So just an offer there. Thank you. Thank you so much.
you know, I, I think with, when you're, that, with the mural part, you added STEAM, right? Science, technology, science, technology engineering, arts, and math. Uh, because what it comes down to is emotion, right? Uh, is, is driving emotion. Unfortunately, we have to wrap here. We've got uh, a lot of amazing other talks coming, and we'll be all out in the hallways later, so definitely grab these guys. But these folks, not guys, guys and girls, women and men. I, mean, I, I don't even know what to say. I'm just not going to say anything. OK. It's so awkward now. But, <laughs> but I will say this, is that um, I'm sorry, Philippe. We can't get your question. We don't have our clock is blinking at me saying stop. But I will end with this very profound thought, uh, which is that um, 130 years ago, this society was started by one of the greatest innovators of our time, ever. Uh, and it wasn't that that person had the technical know-how to be able to put these things together that really made the difference. It was the imagination. It was just imagination. And all the work that you've done was imagined first, and then it became reality. And that part of imagination is what's so powerful, the audacity of human imagination. And when I think of the challenges that we face, it's the imagination of the human spirit that provides hope. So let's, let's imagine a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you.